And good morning, everyone. Um, sure. Jacques, I hope you haven't left since you still have a little bit of minutes there. There are yes. some comments in the chat before we start with the session. Yeah. Yes, I've read Lizette's comments. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, maybe you can also repeat because I see that there are some people who just joined. Maybe if they can also unmute and talk to you for the next five to ten minutes before we start with the session. I'm going to allow that so that okay. they, can, they can have a discussion with you. Right, so um, I think some of us, um, you know, that he's, he's saying that psychologists or future psychologists are actually, um, they, they, um, they are linguistically able to voice and not just only to listen. Um, so if you want to share some of your thoughts, you can unmute yourself. But um, when you look at research analytics, right, and the session that Elizabeth Boy is going to present now, why is it important um, 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 for support to be given at, at this level, at third year level? Is there anyone that want to unmute and just give us two or three sentences? Jacques, it's Lizette speaking. Hi Lizette, a very nice response I've read and I will <laughs> consider that. Thank you, Jacques. Yeah. So, so Jacques, on a third year level, so I understand the importance of the research um, statistics and analysis because if I'm going to do a survey or a questionnaire, say if I'm going to work in a school environment or I'm going to work in a company or wherever I'm going to work and I need to do a survey on maybe stress, how stress is related in the workplace or how yeah. stress is related. So I would need to do um, the, the quantitative uh, I would need to gather quantitative information, so I can't just it can't just be by having conversations with people. I need to work out how many people, and so it's a, I understand the, the idea about you have to have the quantitative um, information as well, not just the qualitative. So if I, if I'm going to do a survey, I need to need to be able to work out mathematically how many people suffer from stress due to work-related incidents or stuff like that. So that is my view on why we need this um, research analysis and statistics uh, theory, especially in the third year, because you're coming to an end, so to say. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, um, Lizette, for that. I will really, really consider that and integrate that into my report. Is there anyone more? Um, Andrea? Simpson? Andrea? Hello, it's Kim speaking. Um, I just hey, joined Kim. late. I didn't hear what you said about the recordings and where we find the links and everything because I had to go via Miss Boy. I didn't even know where to get onto the link. So I don't know if I've missed something, but if you could just say that again, please. Okay, thank you so much, Kim, for that. Um, Kim, I was just um, I'm telling people that, um, um, you know, at this point, we've got around about um, 58 academic literacy sessions um, running. And um, that is apart from the tutorials. Now, um, at this point, I think a lot of people confuse the two with one another. Um, tutorials look much more on in terms of content. Um, so, so um, they will take you through the study guide on certain areas that's difficult. But academic literacies look at the skills needed to jump from the different levels um, and to have those skills consolidated from one level to another. So, so um, when you when you end um, this um, your third year, for example, um, we will have some research workshops on honest level that's not allowed in the tutorial um, um, domain. Um, so, so, so in terms of um, academic literacy, a lot of people think that they are academically literate, which, which is right. But we want just to equip people a little bit more with the skills. So that's why um, we agreed as from this year onwards to, um, to integrate research analytics. 
And we can't call it research psychology or anything like that because then it will borderline what the academics want. So, so, so we just say that we look at the skills in terms of research analytics um, for psychology. Now, um, now each se um, every um, second week, Elizabeth is going to present um, um, some sessions um, on how to use um, scientific or whatever calculators, how to work out calculators, uh, how how to work out. Um, information, qualitative information, and how to read for statistics, especially um, for the human sciences. Um, but you can also ask some some examples for her to explain um, in, um, for you to get a better understanding. At this point, with the rain and everything the last two weeks, um, connection has been so bad and some of the recordings fail that we're trying to recover, but we are running a little bit behind on the downloading of and the uploading of of the of the previous sessions. So if you can just be patient for about two more weeks, then we will start um, populating the research analytics videos that Elizabeth created um, online. And um, yeah, so so then we'll then we will be able to um, then you can have a repository where you can forward and and rewind certain sessions and 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 just pace yourself in terms of um, of 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 what you understand or what you don't understand. And um, remember, we're also going to have um, a, a, a group consultations um, that is going to take place. Um, the group consultations will not take place the next two two weeks, but very close to the examination. Um, where Elizabeth will have some some individualized or or group um, sessions on areas that you still, still find difficulties prior to entering the examination. Um, but I will communicate that with all of you closer to the time. Um, Kim, I I know it was a very lengthy answer, but did you um what did it make sense to some extent? Okay, um, I'm even more confused, but never mind. I just want no, to no, no, is you this, can is talk. this the stats lecture for three seven oh four? That's what I need to know. Yes, I'm yes, very yes, very yes. um dinosaurish yes. with all this. So that, okay, just as long as I know I'm here and that there will be recordings coming up. That's cool. Thank you. No, and I don't, think, I don't get any, any links sent to me or any um, emails about this. I just sort of came about it via Elizabeth. So okay. if you could, I don't know where we must find you. Um, you you know, um, Elizabeth, have you shown them the um, will, um, the schedule on Mayunisa? I will do find? that. Yeah, I will do that. Okay. Okay. Otherwise, I can also do that. Um, um, I, I can... Uh, okay. I, I think it was. Oh, yeah. I, um. Let me just say, let let me just do that part now while you're still here as well. Okay. Okay. So, okay. I will. I don't know what's happening with the lobbying. I think it's. Oh, it's case. I think it's it. Yes, your settings. You must go back to the setting and check if you set. I will do that. I will do that. Um, but I'm now just admitting people. Um. But um, but this is a class for PYC three seven zero four. Okay. Um, it is an um a little bit of a ex extra extraordinary class or um an ad hoc class because the link this week there was it was faulty. Um, so so we're just trying to make up, but I will make sure that everyone that's in attendance today will receive the updated schedule. Thank you. The other people on the WhatsApp group that are asking the same questions as me, and I don't know how to get back from this <laughs> onto the WhatsApp group to tell them. So if somebody could do that, I am very dinosaurish of all of this. So I'm going to stay here now. Thank you. OK. OK. So to access the, the, the schedule or the session plans for every two weeks, you will have to go via my UNISA. Um, and I think um, we will share with you the link as well. So when you go on to my UNISA, 
uh, you will through that link if you go via the link you don't have to go through this whole process um hmm. my machine is very slow <coughs> um don't know why looks like it's stuck uh, okay it still says loading but you will go through my unisa and there is, oh, there we go. Um, you will get access to the Western Cape region because we will have given you that link. And if you are already registered student at Western Cape, you will have this link loaded, I think, on your machine or on your MyUNISA site. When you look at the home page, we are under the Numeracy Center. So you will click on the numeracy center. I think my browser is small, sorry. Um, on the numeracy center and under the numeracy center, there is the schedule. So every week you can come here and check the schedule for Tuesdays because I think the sessions will be every second week on Tuesdays. You will look under the Tuesday schedule will appear there and there will be a joint session, which is the the link to MS team. And there is also the link to the notes and the recording. You don't have to go through that because this is only for it. The, the, the session plan or the schedule, this schedule only reflects per week. So, for example, the previous notes and recordings, you will not find them if you only look at this area you need to scroll down to the bottom when you scroll down you will have this section as well where it contains the links to the the, the notes and the recording so we're looking for the research analytics literacies which is this a uh, link when you click on it it should take you to this session section of the site where at the top is the resources if i click on the resources it will take me to the notes and your recordings will appear at the bottom and since we only had one session and this is our second session so today's session will be loaded here after 48 hours or more depending on how quickly um, the unisa people work in the back end um, and if you want to check the notes, since the notes will be uploaded here, so the session plans. So under the session or the schedule, you will find all the schedules. So you can check what is when is the next session and um, what topic are we discussing on that week. So you can find it there. If I go one, uh, two up, and there are your resources. Um, the summary decision tree is the one that we used in the previous session. Remember that session that we had and the <clears throat> today's session, which we're going to look at the literacies around hypothesis testing. How do we um, answer questions relating to the hypothesis testing and how do we formulate the hypothesis testing and make a decision out of it? The, <clears throat> the notes for today are here. So, during the course of the week, I will upload all the notes for all the session because I'm also trying to catch up with other other sessions that I do notes for or I do to um, facilitations for. So um, I will update this. So we we'll, should have all the notes on here, regardless of which session we are attending. I will have all the notes so that you don't have to. Um, to ask for notes and we can have all the notes well in advance so that you can also prepare for class so that you can come with those questions and make the sessions interactive as well so i will post all of them here so going back remember you go to the western cape region site and you will click under the numeracy and that's where you will find all the information the session plan the link to the session um, for that day will be under the join, uh, join the session. And other than that, 
if you need the recording, then you go to the bottom of the page. Any questions? Because then we are done. Yeah, Elizabeth, I just want to remind everyone to complete the register so that I can um, um, just email them, um, you know, anything that they need to know. And um, because I'm going to use the student number um, and PCC them um, in the future. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Would you be OK to handle? Um, may yes. I leave? OK, then yes. all the best to all the students. Um, if you've got any any questions or support, just reach out to us. Um, the seat in TUT, remember, that is for learner support. Um, um, so all of your questions will, 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 will um, be placed in my folder, and then I will just be able to respond to you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. No problem, Jack. Enjoy your weekend. I will do so. Thank you. Keep warm and keep safe, everyone. OK, so let's start with the session. So <clears throat> welcome to your research analytics online session. Um, like I said, the session for July, we will have another session on the 20th, which is Tuesday between 6 and 8. Uh, and that session, we will look at hypothesis testing for two samples. So today we're only going to concentrate on one sample when we have one sample size. I'm not going to ask that question right now, so we're just going to dive in. Um, <clears throat> maybe also to add to what Jacques said. Remember, this is not about um, the research module, the Psych 3704. It's about the literacies within the Psych 3704. So there might be some of the, the topics or some of the content that I don't delve deep into. Um, and I think we did explain this in the first session that we had to remember the Q&A session that we had to say I'm only going to concentrate on more of the quantitative skills, more of the uh, calculations and um, things that relates to statistical uh, methodologies within your psych 3704. Things that relates to the other part of your psych 314 like which are like your um, your psychology your psychology content. If you want to understand and unpack um, those um, content, um, I think then we will have to have a separate consultation, um, or you can consult your lecture as well with regards to those ones. So, because also for me to also structure the the literacies, I need to find the challenging literacies or skills that are challenging within site 304 and not dwell too much in terms of your content of 3704. So I hope you will understand that we're not doing tutorials. We're not going to go into concept explaining what constructs means, explaining what mediators are and and and, and. we're not going to do that. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm here with an assumption that you know all those discussions, you know all those definitions. Um, we just here to do some of the technicalities or skills that are relating to answering those some of those questions. OK, so with hypothesis testing, by the end of today's session, you should be able to learn the basic principles of applying hypothesis questions. Uh, hypothesis testing in order for you to be able to answer some of the questions. Um, you should be able to also use the hypothesis testing for the mean, which is what we're doing today, to make a decision. And when we talk about the hypothesis testing for the mean, there are two ways that you can calculate or find the hypothesis testing. Sometimes 
the population standard deviation is given. Sometimes the population standard deviation is not given. So you need to know when those um, times are applicable so that you can use the right formulas, the right um, uh, calculations as well, and make the right decisions as well. So what is hypothesis testing? So with everything, we need to also make sure that everybody is on the same page. Hypothesis testing is one of the um, statistical branches um, or technique that we use for one of the branches of statistics, which is inferential statistics. And we know with inferential statistics, we the, the, the parameters that we use to calculate we um, that we collect from the sample we use that information to infer back to the population so with inferential statistics we make conclusion about the population using the sample measures so hypothesis testing is one of those process that we use and with hypothesis testing um, the researcher most of the time wants to claim something or wants to prove the claim that they have. So they might um, want to prove that in South Africa, uh, the if we take the COVID-19, super spreader events are more likely to, to have more people be uh, or contract the COVID-19. That is the the claim that the researcher is making to say when we have super spreader events, there are more likely people to contract COVID. We need to prove that because we cannot take it to face value. We need to prove that. And that is the role of a hypothesis testing. So there should also be another side of that story. It might be that what we need to prove is that the super spreader events are not so we're going to prove the opposite of what the researcher is claiming that should be the norm. And that is hypothesis testing. So there are several steps that you need to know and learn when you do hypothesis testing as well. So when we do hypothesis testing, like I said, you have, the researcher has a claim, but there should be an alternative to that claim. So there should be a two side to that. And this is also the same as you are innocent until proven guilty. So they, you, are, you have two sides of every story. And we know that say. So once you stated your hypothesis testing, which will contain the, the claim and the alternative of that claim, then you need to also know how you're going to make a decision. What kind of a method you're going to apply to make those decisions? Um, and this is based, and this will be based on the things that are given to you to make that claim. For example, like I said, because we're doing hypothesis testing for the mean, you need to know that your population is normally distributed, and you need to know that the population standard deviation is given or not given. And if your population is not normally distributed, you need to know that you are given a huge sample size. So those are the things that you need to know when you're going to make a decision about something, because we're going to infer the results that we get back to the population. Once you know all those um, decision methods that you're going to apply, then you need to calculate, you need to compute, you need to make sure that you create measures that can help you to make or reach those decisions because sometimes a numerical value can assist. One measure can tell a huge story. And once you have those measures, you can compare it with other measures. For example, we're going to calculate what we call the Test statistic. Your test statistic is those measures that you calculate. Then you're going to find the p value, which is your probability value. Once we have the p value from the test statistic, then we can make a decision because we can take the p value, compare it 
to the level of significance, which is our alpha, and make a decision. Or we can take our test statistic, compare it to the critical values, and make a decision. And when we make a decision, those decisions will be based on, depending also on the hypothesis testing that you are testing. And we're going to unpack all this in a short bit. So depending on your alternative hypothesis, which is the, the alternative claim of what the researcher wants to prove, depending on the sign that is located there, what I prefer to in terms of the sign, we'll go into that later on, will assist with knowing what decisions you need to make, whether you're making a one directional decision or whether it's a two directional or two tailed um, decisions that you need to make. So the sign that you put in your alternative will tell a lot of or will assist with making a decision. And we're going to look at that shortly, as well as the p value and the alpha value or the level of significance will also assist us in making the decision. So since we know the steps now, how do we make that decision? So making the decision, like I said, we can either reject or accept. We do not actually also say accept, but we can only say we reject or not reject. Reason being is we cannot accept something that we're not 100% sure of, but we can reject it or not reject it, but not uh, automatically say we accept it. So the only two words you will use when you make a decision will either be do not reject the null hypothesis or reject the null hypothesis. When we do or when we make a conclusion, we do not rely on the alternative hypothesis, but we make we make use of the alternative hypothesis to assist us to make a decision but when we state the decision, we state it in relation to the null hypothesis, because that is the claim that the researcher is making. Okay. When, sometimes, let, let's put it this way, sometimes the researcher might say um, they want to claim that it is more than. Okay, so when the researchers in their statement, they say something like more than or less than. So let's say we want to put it as a hypothesis testing statement. So when we do the null hypothesis, which is what the researcher is claiming, we always, always use the population parameters to state the claim. So the researcher wants to prove more than. We cannot put the greater than in the statement of the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis always contains the less than information. So in that instance, therefore, the alternative will contain the researcher statement, and I'm going to explain this just now. So, the researcher, let's say they want to claim that more than 30 people or 30 on average. So, this now becomes the alternative, but we know that this is the claim that the researcher wants to prove. So, therefore, in your null hypothesis, we will say the researcher wants to pr prove the alternative <coughs> of that. Um, can I also ask that in the absence of Jacques, when he's not here and you can see the pop-up comes through of people wanting to be admitted, can you guys press the admit button if you have or if you can? So, then we're going to state that the researcher wants to prove something else. So this we know that this is the false statement. And I'm coming to that just now. That is the false statement. But if, so this is number one, remember that. 
So if the researcher wants to prove that less than 30, on average, um, less than 30 people contract um, COVID-19, so then statement number two, like, well, example number two, so this one states that the researcher wants to prove that on average, less than 30 people contract uh, uh, COVID. Then the alternative of that statement will be the mean of greater than 30 people con contract um, COVID. And this is, this is true of what the researcher wants it to prove. So when we make a decision in these two statements, we are going to be committing some type of an error. When we make a decision, based on those two statements. So let's say, for example, statement number one. Statement number one, if we make a decision and we do not re reject the null hypothesis. State number one says do not reject the null hypothesis. So if we do not reject the null hypothesis, therefore we are failing to reject the false null, null hypothesis because this is not what the researcher wanted to prove. So in this instance, we will be committing what we call a type two error. Because in this instance, we need to be committing a type one error because we want we, we actually want to reject the null hypothesis and make the alternative true. But because we're not rejecting this null hypothesis, we are committing what we call a type two error. With statement number two, where this is what the researcher wants to prove. If we reject this null hypothesis on statement number two, we are committing what we call a type one error. And that brings me to this. A type one error is when we reject a true null hypothesis. If we reject what the researcher is claiming, and that is the case that they stated that they claiming that, and we reject it, then we are committing a type one error. And that is the error that for all, most of the, most of the hypothesis testing, when we fail to, or when we reject the null hypothesis, we, we will be committing it. It's a good error to use, actually, because it will give you the correct decisions that you have. Um, and it will actually, it doesn't give you the correct decisions for all the measures, but it, you, um, in terms of decisions, you, you find that you will get very few people who are incorrectly placed within those categories as well. When we commit what we call a type two error, it is when we are not rejecting, we are failing to reject the false null hypothesis. Therefore, it means if we go back to this, this statement will say we do not reject the null hypothesis. So this one will say we do not reject the null hypothesis, therefore we are committing a type two error. It is when we fail to reject the false hypothesis, the false null hypothesis testing. I hope by now you understand a little bit about the hypothesis testing. Okay, now let's learn how we do the hypothesis testing, the actual hypothesis testing. So to do the hypothesis testing, 
remember we need to state the null hypothesis. Remember the four steps. First step is to state your null hypothesis and your alternative hypothesis. So your null hypothesis always contains the equality sign. So in the null hypothesis, it doesn't really matter what the sign says. It will always contain the equality sign, whether it is the equal or greater than or equal or less than or equal. The most important statement it is what happens in your alternative hypothesis. The statement that comes in your alternative hypothesis and then alternative hypothesis, sometimes it's subscript one, it's H subscript one. And here we can state if it is equal, we say it is not equal. Sometimes we use subscript A, sometimes we use subscript uh, one. Here are the statements for the null, for the alternative hypothesis. So for an alternative hypothesis, remember for the null hypothesis, we can either have any of those, but usually an equal sign surface. In your alternative hypothesis, you need to be very, very careful in terms of the sign that you place Mommy, there. And please make sure that you are always muted. Mommy. Elena, Elian. Please make sure that you muted. And please, and please uh, switch off your videos. Elin. Can you please um, switch off your video as well? Okay, so in your alternative hypothesis, you go into state. If it's, if the claim was for equal, then you go into put not equal. And when you say it is not equal, then we are creating what we call a non-directional test or a two-tailed test because here we will have two areas where we make decisions and with hypothesis testing we always use the small areas so for example the area for a two-tailed test since this is a normal distribution the area will be those areas for a two-tailed test. You go in to make the decision based on those two areas. So anything that falls in this area or that area, because you're only calculating your test statistic, which is this test statistic, you only calculate it once. Anything that falls within those two areas, you go in to reject your null hypothesis. If it falls this side or that side, you reject the null hypothesis. That is for a two tail or what we call a non directional test. Because this has two areas to make a decision. For the less than or greater than for these two, let's start with the one, the greater than. So for the greater than, then the researcher would have wanted to prove that the the mean is less than therefore in your alternative you will put the mean is greater than the decision because this is a one tail test and it is a directional so always remember for the sign where it says the current 
uh, that gives you the 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 right the angle like that, the greater than. So it looks like that. So therefore, it means the area will be to the right. So then, for the decision, when you go make the decision. Once you have calculated your test statistic and went and found the p values and the critical values, you're going to use one side of the test. So the area will be to this side or to the right side. And this is one direction or a directional or upper tail test. For a less than for a less than, therefore, the null hypothesis would have been that the researcher wants that to prove a greater than or equal. Therefore, for a less than, the rejection area would have been on the left side so this will be your rejection area and this is also a one tail test or a one directional test or a left or lower tail test or a left test you can take many definition of it so when we do the hypothesis testing, you need to remember to state your null hypothesis and your alternative hypothesis because they will help you in terms of making a decision. You also need to state what you are given in terms of whether are you given the population mean. Step number two is to state what you are given so that you know what test statistics you're going to be calculating. So in this instance, because we're using a Z, therefore the population standard deviation should be known. So it means they would have given us sigma or they would have given you and told you that the population has a standard deviation of this much or they would have said the population standard deviation is. And then you can use your test statistics, which is the Z score or the Z value of your sampling distribution formula, which is your sample mean minus your population mean divided by the standard error, which is the standard deviation of a population. So is the population standard deviation divided by your sigma. And remember, this is for the mean when the population standard deviation is known. So we know that this is sigma bar, which is our standard error, is the same as our sigma divided by the square root of n. It doesn't mean when you're answering questions on hypothesis testing, they cannot ask you questions around the sampling distribution, uh, things that you know, which includes also the standard error. So you need to know that the standard error for the population mean it is the value underneath the line there, which is your population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And we can, we're going to do some examples and then we can look at how we apply all this. And once you have your test statistics, then you can, you will know which test you are doing, then you can go and find the p-value. Um, so, the next slide, I'm just explaining the same thing that I just did with you there in terms of the region of rejection, in terms of the one tail test, uh, where it is great, uh, greater than, less than on your alternative hypothesis, and for a two tail test, in terms of where your region of rejection will be. <clears throat> so, once we have calculated the Z test, Remember, we calculated that Z test, statist our Z statistic. Then we need to go and make a decision. Making a decision, we need to use the P value, which is our probability value. So we're going to take the Z test. 
we're going to take the value we find on the Z formula once we have calculated, let's say our mean minus the population mean divided by the standard deviation over the square root of N. And we calculated this and we found that it's 1.13. We're going to take this value. We're going to go to the table, the normal distribution table. We're going to look at the one the, sorry, not the one, but the small portion, the small portion side. We're going to look at the small portion side. What is the value that we are looking for in terms of the p-value? So we'll read 1.13 and go there and find the value. And once we have the value of our p-value on the one-sided test, then we can make a decision. If the value of our p-value is less than or equals to alpha, then we reject the null hypothesis. If the value of P value, if it's less than or equals to alpha, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Otherwise, we go, do not have to reject the null hypothesis if it's greater than the alpha value we do not reject. So it means if the p value is less, we reject. If it's small, it must go. The smaller the p value or equal, small or equal, it must go. We reject the null hypothesis. We reject the claim that the researcher is making. <clears throat> On the same aspect of oh, Maybe I should have put this before when we were still busy discussing the test statistic. We need to also remember that also in terms of the Z value or the test statistic, which is this test statistic that you calculate, you must always, always remember and bear in mind the effect size. And the effect size is based on the value of your N. And this <coughs> will tell you um, how big or small your Z score will be. And this is what we also use to determine the sensitivity or the power of a statistical test. So the bigger the sample size, the closer your, uh, your, your, your test will be significant. Um, and the smaller your sample size, the the chances are your p-value significance will be very big and you will end up not or not rejecting the null hypothesis. With that, we just covered when we are given the population standard deviation. The same method will still apply of the hypothesis testing, stating the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis, stating what you are given because you want to know what test statistic you're going to be using and how you're going to make a decision. If the population standard deviation is not given and your sample size or your population is small because you don't know the value of your population, if your population is so small that you can't even calculate the standard deviation of that population. So therefore it means in the absence of the population standard deviation, they would have given you the sample standard deviation. Therefore it means we're going to use the T statistic formula. The same, the null hypothesis alternative will still work the same, but the, when we use the critical values, the challenge or the difference then becomes when we go and find the critical values, not the T values. And in your module, you don't have to worry about the critical value areas at this point, but the same concepts will apply. So in terms of the P value for your T test, in your module, they made it easy because it's very difficult to find the P value for T test. So they will give you the T value. They will tell you that the P value for T is this. 
but you just need to make sure that you know how to make a decision when you're basing it on the p-value as well. And similar, your null hypothesis and alternative will always stay the same. So what have we learned so far? What we've learned so far is if we do hypothesis testing, for the mean, then there are two things that can happen. If the population standard deviation is known or given to us, or if the population standard deviation is unknown, therefore it's not given to us, we need to know that if the population standard deviation is known or given, then we're going to use the Z alpha mean by E divided by the standard error. If it's not known, then we're going to use T, which is alpha B minus the mean divided by the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of N. That we know now. The other thing that we need to know about the hypothesis testing in general is we need to know that we need to state the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. The value in your null hypothesis, if it's equal, then it will be a non-directional non hypothesis. If it's greater than or equal, therefore it will be a one-directional. If it is less than or equal, then it will also be a one-directional. We also know that based on the value of the z, where we can find the p-value, if we find the p-value. If our p-value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. If we use the critical values, then we can find the region of rejections because we know that this area we reject, that area we reject for a two-tailed, for a one-tailed. If it's less than for a one-tailed, the area that we reject for the one tail will be that area for a less than. If it's for a greater than, the area that we reject for a greater than will be that area. And those are the things that you always need to remember when you do hypothesis testing. So let's apply, let's look at example on applying the all the steps of hypothesis testing and how we use the table to find the p-value. Okay, so we're gonna come to this example that we have. Before I go to the example, do you have any question? Don't ask me to go to the black screen. It's gone. We won't have that anymore. Any questions? If there are no questions, then we can look at the example. Before we look at the example, I'm going to check the chat uh, if there's anything there. Okay, nothing, no questions in the chat. Please make sure that you complete the register. Those who joined late, I just reposted the register in the chat. Please make sure that you complete that. Okay, let's look at this. So, we need to read the statement and understand what exactly we are given in this statement. Identify the key elements that we will need to assist us in making a decision. And then we will do the calculations and then make a decision. Okay, so Mabato, the social scientist, took a random sample of 30 adults with autism spectrum dis disorder, ASD, and found their reading time to be normally distributed 
with the sample mean and the sample standard deviation of 90 width per minute and 18 WPM respectively. Butali and Mamato are collaborating to test the hypothesis that the mean reading of the adult with ASD is less than 100. Okay, so that was supposed to be less less than less than 100. Assume a 5% level of significance. So remember there are four steps of hypothesis testing. In your exams or your assignments, these questions might be, or the, the four steps might be a question on their own. Like they might ask you that uh, because you're writing multiple choice questions. So a um, the hypothesis testing will be a question on its own. A test statistic might be a question on its own. Decision making might be a question on its own. Standard error might be a question on its own. So you, you just need to know the steps and know how to make a decision and how to get there in order for you to be able to answer all the questions. So let's start with the hypothesis testing. So we know that the first step is to state our null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis. So reading the questions, what are we actually given in terms of us to enable us to read to answer the hypothesis testing question. It says they need to test the hypothesis that, that the mean reading of adults with ASD is less than 100. So it means we need less than 100. Now, here is the catch. We know that the researcher wants to prove that it is less than, but we cannot put it in the null hypothesis where are we going to put it we're going to put it in the alternative so therefore it means our mean reading will be less than a hundred therefore whatever i put in the null hypothesis does not matter because i can just say it is hundred um or i can use the correct sign and say it is greater than or equals to 100. So in the, in the null hypothesis, you can leave your null hypothesis as equal or, or a greater than. It will not change anything. The most important one or the most important sign is the one that is sitting or located in your alternative hypothesis. So what are we given? So we need to go back to the statements above and state what we are given. We're given the sample size. So our N is equals to 30. We are told that, found that uh, the, the reading time is normally distributed with the sample mean and the sample standard deviation. So sample mean, which means X bar, sample mean is X bar. Remember, all the Greek letters will represent the population parameters. All the normal letters um, of your um, alphabet will represent your sample statistics. So our sample mean will be 90 because it says sample mean and samples and sample standard deviation of 90 and 18 respectively. So the first one will be the sample mean. The second one will be the sample standard deviation. So since they give us the sample standard deviation and the sample statistic is S or the symbol is S, which is 18. Therefore, it means our population standard deviation is unknown. And when the population standard deviation is unknown, then it means 
we need to find. Let's go to step number three. We need to go find our test statistic, which is T, which will be your X bar minus your mean divided by S divided by the square root of N. Before I go calculate this, actually, we need to go back to the top one because what I didn't do there, I I needed to also state what type of a test then will this be. This is a directional test. And it's also a lower one tail test, or you can say it's a one directional test. Um, or a tail, a one tail test, or a lower limit test, and so forth. So, yeah. So now let's calculate this. I'm going to show you on my calculator. Depending on what type of a calculator you have as well. So let's substitute the values. So here we have ninety minus the population mean which is your mu is always going to be stated in your hypothesis testing which is 100 divided by your standard sample standard deviation is 18 and your Sample size is n divided by the square root of n is state. So depending on the type of a calculator you have, so since I have a different calculator to yours, I'm going to share my entire screen. I'll come back to, to the presentation shortly. So I want to share my calculator. Okay. No, it's fine. So here we have our test statistics. So I'm going to use my calculator. This calculator is a Casio calculator. If you do have Casio, which has a fractional calculate, uh, fractional things like this, if you don't own one, it doesn't matter. You can use any calculator that you have. As long as it's a scientific calculator and it has square root or it's got the powers, you can use that. So on this calculator with the fraction, I can put the entire formula into the equation. So by using my fraction, because, sorry, my bad. Uh, by using the fraction, I do the first fraction, which is the top which is x bar minus the mean divided by the standard error so that will give me my x bar is 90 minus 100 and when i go down with the arrow when i come to the block at the bottom i need to do the same as what the block at the bottom uh, sorry the um the values are at the bottom so there is a fraction so i'm going back to the fraction and create it as a fraction and say 18 and then take my arrow down divide by the square root of 30. so on this calculator i'm able to do that on those calculators where you do not have a fraction the first thing you need to do is say 18 divided by the square root of 30. Find the answer, then take the answer you get at the top, divide by the answer you get at the bottom. Do not try and do everything all at once on your calculator. It will not work. Say equal, and when I get the answer that looks like this, then I can just take it to... 
Sorry, Miss Boy. Yes. I don't know if you're trying to show us your calculator, but it's not coming up on the screen. Is the calculator not shared? No. No. Can't you see my yes, there it, there it is now, yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought I did share the entire screen. Okay, so if I show you the formula. The formula is 90 minus 18 divided by 30. And because my answer is in this root function, I want it as a decimal. And that is my answer of minus. 3,03 and I can leave it to two decimals and here yeah, the answer is minus 3,0 must go back forgot now 0, 0,4 okay so because this is a t calculations i cannot do the p value i cannot go find the p value even if i go to your let's see even if i go there the only table you get yeah is your your normal distribution table so we cannot find the t the p value for a for a t distribution uh, you can only find it when you when you use a statistical uh, software. So I'm not going to do the p-value on this question. Um, I am also not going to use the critical values because you do not have the table to find the critical value. I'm going to leave it at that because I'm going to assume for your For your module, you, you do not get to use the critical values. But let's say, let's assume now, let's assume like they will do the assumptions for you. Let's assume that our p value, let's assume our p value in this instance is 0, 0.003. Let's assume that our p-value is 0, 0,03. Now we need to make a decision. So number four, we're going to make a decision because we need, to, if this was z, we would have used the z value to go to the z table and go find the p-value. So now we don't have the p-value. Let's say this is our p-value. So we need to make a decision. A decision, so the de decision rule, Remember the decision rule states that if the p value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. That is the rule. So let's make that decision now. What is our p value? Our p value is equals to 0, 0,03 and what is our alpha our alpha is equals to they gave us 0, 0,05 0, 0,05 is this bigger than is this greater than or less than so this will be less than because we know that 0, 0,03 is less than our alpha of 0, 0,05 therefore we reject the null hypothesis. So we, we can say we reject the null hypothesis in this instance. So what you have learned from this is you should be able to know how to state your null hypothesis and alternative. What test is that? Is it the directional and non-directional? What are the things that you are given so that they can assist you identify what type of a test you're going to do? Is it a t-test or a z-test? And do the calculation to find the test statistic. And once you have the test statistic, you need to go find the p-value. In the instances where p-value cannot be found automatically, for the z-value, you should be able to find this, the t, the, the p-value because 
when you go to your ta table, sorry, I've got so many things open. When you come to the Z table, these are your Z values. So let's say our Z, our Z was 0, comma, I just want to choose the one that is here, 0, comma, 0,15. If our Z is 0, 0,15, so we just come to the Z, we're always going to use for hypothesis testing the smaller portion because remember, for whichever the decision you're making, you're using the smaller side, whether it's a one tail, whether it's only this side or only that side, or it's a two tail where you apply both, we always rely on the smaller portion side. So therefore, your p-value in this instance will be your p-value would have been 0 0.44 and you will make a decision based on that so you will say your p value of 0 0.04 it's less than you oh sorry it's not less than it is greater than therefore in this instance we will not reject the null hypothesis and that's how you will use the z values to find your p value and make a decision Let's look at another example before we look at how the questions are asked in your module as well. Okay. So here is another example. So on this example, they ask if a sample size of n 20 is selected from a normal population, the sample mean of 58, the population standard deviation of 12. Suppose that the e Twitter wants to test the following hypothesis. Your hypothesis is mu is equals to 55, and the hypothesis mu is equals to 50, not equals to 55. So step number one done for us, the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis are stated. So we do have our null hypothesis. The mean is 55. The null hypothesis or alternative hypothesis, the mean is not equals to 55. What type of test is this? Now, yeah, me and you, we're going to answer this together. What type of test is this? Is it a directional and non-directional test? Non-directional. Yes, it's a non-directional test. Um, can I just give me a sec? Uh, when my screen is shared like this, it doesn't... And struggle to find my pen. Okay. So this is a a non non directional test. Step number two: state what you are given. What are we given here that will help us to answer the questions? You are given n of 20. We are given the sample mean of 58. We are given the population standard deviation, which is sigma of 12. So, yeah. Population standard deviation is known. Sigma is known. And when sigma is known, step number three, it means we need to do the calculation for Z test statistic, which is the sample mean minus the population mean divided by the population standard deviation divided by the square root of N. Let me go back one step backwards. So sorry, I forgot to mention this here. 
So this at the bottom, it is the same, you know, because we have the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n, it is our sampling error, which is s, s bar. Ne? Similar when we have the sigma over the square root of n, this is our sig sigma x bar, which is our standard error. So, which is our standard error. So now let's substitute the values into the formula and calculate. Our x bar is 58 minus our mean, always given in the null hypothesis and alternative, which is 55, divided by our standard error. Can I ask you to do the calculations and we can find the answer? So the standard deviation is 12 divided by the square root of your n is 20, not n, but we need to substitute with the right value, which is 20. Can you do the calculation and give me the answer? Or do you want me to do the calculation? Do we, do you have the answer? No. Okay. The answer here is one, one comma one one eight, which will be one comma one 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 two. So we're going to round it off to two decimals is one, one two, because our Z table has only two values so and this is where it becomes very tricky because i need to move between two screens are you able to see the table yes yes right. so remember our z that we calculated, if I can show you from the calculator. So 58 minus 55 divided by 12 divided by the square root of 20 gives us 1,118. Since we're going to use the Z table and the Z table contains only or it only has two decimals so we need to round off our answer to two decimal which is z is equals to one one two so we need to go to the smaller side so we need first we need to find the our z of one so you have to scroll to the one we're looking for one one two which is, eh? and we need to go to the larger portion. Sorry, the smaller portion. What am I looking at now? Which is zero comma one three one four. Our p value 
is zero comma. One three one four. Okay, so now we need to be very careful as well because this is not a one directional. So, what we have found so far, we have found one side. We have found because this is two directional, so it means it has two p uh, two regions so even this will fall within two areas as well so this will be 0 comma 1314 and 0 comma 1314 we'll have to split it into two so therefore this p value for when it is two sided it it's going to be it going is going to be twice the size of one sided one sided p value so it's going to include both both sides so therefore for a two side our p value will be equals to so we need to add both so it will be 0.1314 multiply by 2 because it's the same as adding both so it will be 0 comma 2628 yes so that will be 0 comma 2628 so we need to make a decision now so when we make a decision we're not going to use this to make a decision but we're going to use the p value to make a decision so let's make the decision. We know what the decision rule says. Oh, see, I cannot find my pens. Let's see if I can find them. Just want to change the color. So the decision, we know that it says P value. If it's less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. So, what our p value is, our p value is 0 0.26. I can just leave it at two decimal. Our level of significance, we just take the 5% divide by 100, which is 0 0,05. So, is this less than that? It is greater than. Therefore, we do not reject the null hypothesis, or we can say we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We do not reject the null hypothesis. The other one will say we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And that's how you you do hypothesis testing so all the other questions that you will get either in the exam assignment they will be related to how well you know your steps how well you know how to unpack the question in order to identify the key things that you need to make the right decision like when your population standard deviation is given or is not given whether you need to use a z test or a t test whether if it's a one directional test you only go if it was a one directional test let's say it was a less than we could have just used one zero comma one three one four and made decision based on that only but when it's two directional your p value will be because it's for both sides or we add or multiply and that is why with the p-value, you need to know that for a one-directional, it's a p-value, uh, it's a two-directional p-value divided by two. And if it's a one-direction, if it's a two-direction, it is one direction multiplied by two. Um, and that's all what you need to know about hypothesis testing. So now, for now, let's scan through some of the questions. 
um, if we get time, then we can go through some of your past exam papers, but the discussion should not stop here. We can have these discussions because you are on WhatsApp. We can continue on WhatsApp. So I've picked um, on Tuesday when we were going to do that, I picked some of the questions and I put them on on the slides as well from the exam papers. So um, uh, we're not going to go through the, the exam paper, so I, I started from this one, from the 2009. In, if we can find time, we can do the others. So I used most of the questions, they come from this exam paper. Uh, you will see that also I just did a copy and paste, so don't be surprised when you see the blocks. Okay, <laughs> so let's look at the exercises. So this this is where you need to discuss with me because then I do not I I've been speaking a lot and now it's your time to to speak to speak to speak A researcher wants to test the hypothesis that the mean depressions go on a Oh, sorry, the other thing before I continue, um, if it's an exam paper or anything, I do put there at the top to, to show you um, where did I get that question so that you do not have to ask me that at the later stage, where did I find this or where can I find this? So you should be able to identify where what is, where everything is at. A researcher wants to test the hypothesis that the mean depression score on a depression scale for a patient diagnosed with clinical depression is greater than 120. The statistical hypothesis to be tested is this. They stated the statistical hypothesis. Bear in mind the sign you see on the alternative hypothesis. It's very important. She uses a random sample of N equals to 64 drawn from the population of diagnosed patients and finds that the mean, the sample mean equals 127 and the sample standard deviation S is equal to 24. Which of these values below is the closest to the correct value of S as bar? What is that? What is X S X bar? Is your standard error, which is the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of N. So do that calculation and let me know. And if you have any questions, I just want to go back to the screen. This one. What's the answer? Very easy to do because you have, oh, sorry, I must fix my pen. You have all the questions, the, the, the facts in front of you, so you just substitute and calculate. Uh, what is your S? Is 24 divided by our square root of N, which is 64. And if you don't know how to use your calculator and do some of the calculations, please speak now. Do not be left behind. We know that a square root of 64 is 8, 
So this is 24 divided by 8. And what is 24 divided by 8? Do you have? 3. 3. Is equals to 3. And that will be? Option number? Two. Option number two. Yeah. Yes. Okay. The hypothesis testing when they state that the alternative, the mean is less than 30, is a mm, hypothesis and requires a mm, statistical test. What is this? Directional. Is it directional or non-directional? Directional. So a the mean is a directional and requires what type of a test? Is one the tail. tail or a it's the one, one tail test. Tail. So which makes that the correct answer. When applying a statistical test, the p-value represents the probability of obtaining the mm, does it represent the probability of obtaining the sample statistic under the alternative? Does it represent the population parameter under the null hypothesis? Or does it represent the sample statistic under the null hypothesis? Um, sample statistic under the null hypothesis. In the null hypothesis, we always use population. Yeah, popular po. We oh, we always use population. Parameter in the null hypothesis. So every way where they have the sample statistic, it will not be correct because your null hypothesis always uses, or we always state the null hypothesis using the population parameter even though when we do in the calculations we use the sample statistics to assist us to find the value or make decision but we are basing the area underneath the curve will be for the population parameter because we use the population mean we know that for a normal distribution the area underneath the curve is distributed with the mean of zero and the standard deviation of one. It's always, always the population parameter. I know that we didn't cover that now in class, but I'm, I just hope that it can also give you another information in terms of when you answer this question as well. So the only option which is correct is number two. Type one error occurs when? When do we commit a type one error?
When do we commit a type one error? Uh, hi, we commit it when the alternative hypothesis is wrongly rejected. You are half Half right, half. Hello, I say it's the first one when the null hypothesis is wrongly rejected. Yes, it is the first one. We commit type one error when we reject the true null hypothesis. So it means when we reject the hypo their, their hypothesis wrongly. But it's not purposely, but it's just it means that we are rejecting the claim that the researcher is making. This says we when we're not rejecting it, so if we're not rejecting it, we, then it's fine. Um, if, we re, if we reject the false hypothesis, then we're committing a type two error. So which also, you need to also bear in mind that we don't even, when we commit a type, one error, type two error, we don't always also refer to the alternative because when we make decisions, we conclude with or we use the null hypothesis. So when, when you answer questions like this, do a process of elimination in terms of things that you already know. For example, this should have been an automatic one and then you are left with two statements, then you have a 50-50 chance of selecting the correct statement. Now I'm bringing you to the probability questions uh, chapter. So then you have the two. So, but this is because of that not makes it incorrect. So that is not correct. That is not correct. Okay, so moving on. Next, so this question has a couple of questions linked to it as well. So without reading the whole sentence in a whole, we can identify things. So the sample size of 25, she as she measures the IQ of each using the S A W A I S and the IQ scores of this test are normally distributed um, for this population with the mean of 100 and the standard deviation of that much. So, suppose she finds that the mean IQ of her sample is this and her standard deviation is that. Which of this, uh, which one must she use to do the test statistic? Uh, which is the appropriate test statistics to calculate? And remember today's session is about one sample group net or one sample size. Remember to do a process of elimination. Which test statistic? All I can say is ignore what is written here in the bracket because that is just additional information to confuse you because it's inside the bracket. It means it's just a, it's not to be taken into consideration. It's just, yeah. 
is just to help with other statements going forward, but not for this purpose. So how do we answer this question? The first one, it says it's for independent two groups. It is the difference between two groups just by reading that? No, that one's out. This one will have been out automatically. Then we are left with two. We know that we're dealing with one simple one sample size because they only gave us the sample size of 25 there. Which test statistic? What are we given? Let's let's start with what are we given? What sample standard deviation or are we given the population standard deviation? That is if we ignore what is inside the bracket. That's why I'm highlighting it like that. Suppose have sample is the mean, suppose the mean of a sample is this and the standard deviation is that. So it means the sample standard deviation and the mean and this, the, the sample mean comes from that sample. So since we are given the sample standard deviation, what type of a test are we doing? Miss Boy, I went with the Z test because the standard deviation is known. It's just 17, it's given to us. No. What standard deviation is given to us? No. <laughs> you need to you need to be very careful. Okay. What standard deviation? The sample mean is that oh suppose you find that the mean of a sample is this and the standard deviation is that. So because this comes from the sample from the sample, therefore we are given S. We are not given the population standard deviation. So this is unknown, but we are given S. So when the population standard deviation is unknown, we use a T test. T test. So therefore only op number two would have been the correct one. Like I said, the same statement is going to run multiple. So this is the second one. Hmm. What are the requirements with regards to the type of statistical test that may be required to interpret the results? So here they're asking you whether is this going to be a a one tail test or a two tail test or there won't be any statistical test required. Read the first sentence. Read the first sentence that will give you the key in terms of what you need to, how are you going to state your hypothesis testing? Are you done reading it? I um I think it will be a two-tailed statistical test because we are comparing uh, young adults to their peers. Okay. Do you see where I've I, I've put the blogging? The list then I, means for me. Yes. Are you still do are you still sticking with your two tail? I say one tail because it's less than that less word for me is a signal that we're gonna use the one tail. Yes. That should be the key for you to know whether are you going to do a one tail or a two tail. So it says 
less intelligent, uh, less than. So those others are less than their peers. So that will tell you that you're doing a one till test. Okay. Yeah. So you need you need those keywords that will help you. If they would have said um, a researcher um, hypothesis that babies born prematurely will somehow be different to their peers, then it would have been a two tail. If they say they are more likely more more than their peers, then it would have been a one tail with uh, but a um, it would have been a one directional but a left or oh, sorry not left right or upper tail area or tail test something like that so this part tells you that it's a one directional okay so moving to the next question we left with five minutes uh, and i think let me just before you answer that question let's see oh sorry i only had two questions but if we're not done it doesn't matter we have the whatsapp group you can always ask questions there we can always carry on the discussion on the whatsapp group um a researcher wants to test the following hypothesis and they give you the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis on the basis of the data provided the output from the program indicates that the t value of t equals to 1.72 was found and they calculated the p value so you see here they used a computer program they are able to calculate the p value for a two tail test is given as such. So they already, so here they already combined the, the two values. So it's a two tail test P value. What should the researcher do to evaluate the result of the level of significance at this? Does she have to? The first one, two, three statement is saying she needs to manipulate this. The last one says she needs to make a decision. So what does the researcher needs to do? When I have my p-value and my alpha, what do I need? Step number four. What do we do in step number four? Of the hypothesis testing, we make decisions. So the question is asking you the same thing. What should the researcher do to evaluate the results at the level of significance alpha of 0, 0,05? So are you saying uh, the number four? Yes. Yes. That's what you need to do. You, if I have my p value and my level of significance at this point, there's nothing I need to do. All I need to do here is to compare the value of my p value and my level of significance and make a decision. I don't have to do the division and multiplication and calculation. I would have done the multiplication, division, all those if they gave me a two tailed, but they the the hypothesis was a one directional test so if here if the test here was a less than let's say for argument's sake which option you would have chosen option number two you would have chosen option number nope it wouldn't have been option number two. You would have chosen option number one because before you do anything, you would have evaluated the, to evaluate this. You need to take the two tail test value divided by two because this is a one directional. 
and then make a decision. So probably they wouldn't have had to compare the value of PV because this is a two tail test. You would have taken this two tail test in order to create a one tail test. You will take your two tail divide your two tail test divide by two to find your p value of a one tail test. In order to find a two tail test, you take a one tail. This is equal one one tail tailed p value and you multiply it by two to find the two tailed. So th those are the things that you need to remember at the back of your mind when you answer questions like this, because they can be a little bit tricky. Um, but for this purpose and for this question alone, they gave you a two tail because it's a two tail. They give you a two tail test p value. All you just need to do is take the p value and the alpha and compare them and make a decision. I'm not going to do this, so you can go and answer this on your own. And if you still lost, you can chat on WhatsApp. Let's continue the discussions there. Just to recap, because I need to jump off this meeting and go to another meeting, which started right now at half past. Just to recap, um, we learned the hypothesis test is that you need to know how to state your null hypothesis and alternative. The alternative hypothesis is very important because the sign you put there will tell you what type of a test you're going to run. We learned that you, how you make a decision, and we know that we make a decision based on the null hypothesis. We either can reject or not reject the null hypothesis. We learned how to make a decision based on the p value that we can calculate the test statistics and find the p value and make decisions based on that p value. And if the p value is less than the alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. You also learned that in order for you to calculate that p value, you needed to calculate the test statistic. But for the t test, you do not. Uh, you will not be asked to calculate the p value but for the z test you can be asked to go find the p value on the table or they can ask you questions about the p value so you just take the test statistic you go to the table you look for the z value and you go to the smaller portion to find the p value you need to know that if it's a directional test you you just use the p-value as you find it on the table. If it's a non-directional, which is a two-tailed, then you're going to do um, the value you find on the table. You're going to multiply it by two, or you're going to add it to itself, and that will give you your p-value, and then you make a decision. And that's all what you have learned today. So next week, or not next week, because next that other week on the 20th, we will look at how we do hypothesis testing for independent groups or when we have two groups. With that, enjoy the rest of the weekend. Um, I apologize, I'm not going to be able to answer questions at this point because I need to go to another. I've got a tutorial class right now. Thank you, Ms. Boy. You are more than welcome. Thank you very welcome. much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yes, those who joined late, please Thank remember you, to the register. I'm going to repost it in the chat. Remember, the notes are uploaded as well. I will upload the notes for the <laughs> other sessions so that you can also see what other th topics we're going to discuss mm -hmm. for the future as well. Um, otherwise, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. But no, since I just was on. It was on when I was here inside. I'm sure we got the that one that was. Where we stopped. No. It's not. It's maybe delete the audio. Yes. It it's not recorded.
I've come back. I'm trying to look for more notes. Where can we find the notes?